Did you know that Google Ads brings in 80% of Google's parent company, Alphabet Incorporated's revenue every year? In fact, in 2021, that number equated to $209 billion. Now that is a holy shit number if I've ever heard one. Now, picture this. It's sort of common knowledge statistically that uh, Google Ads provide about a 200% return on investment. That's over averages, right? So some are high, higher, some are lower, but let's take that number for a moment. So if businesses across the world are spending $209 billion in Google ads and Google ads produce a 200% uh, return on investment, that number means that $418 billion in sales are being generated by Google ads. If that doesn't show you that Google ads still work, and still drive a ton of revenue, then I don't know what will. Hey everyone, I'm John Timmerman, founder of Good Monster, a performance marketing agency, and I'm here to talk to you about Google Ads today. Now, if you're watching this, you're a marketer, or business owner, entrepreneur, or somebody that's running the marketing in your company, most likely. And you've obviously heard of Google Ads. Most of you are probably even using them. But I'm here to talk to you about where Google Ads are in 2022, why they're still relevant, how to use them, how to find profit from them, and to provide some of you out there a little bit of a little, you know, push to, to keep going and to really take a close look at your PPC campaign, specifically your Google Ads campaign, to try to get them to produce a little bit more revenue. Now, if you're hearing me right now, I sound super nasally. I just got over COVID. My whole family have it. Many of you are dealing with it. Um, it is still here, but I feel good. I might just sound a little raspy. But nonetheless, let's take a look at where Google Ads are in today's age. Now, there are eight types of Google Ads out there currently um, that you can choose from. Some of them have different purposes and different values, but let's take a look at each of the uh, different categories of Google ads before we dive into how to use them. Now, the first type of ad is called a responsive search ad. Now, this is replacing Google's previous type of ad, the standard text ad, um, or then the expanded text ad. Now it's the responsive search ad. And all this means is that Google's updating their algorithms and their software to make things more dynamic. And it's sort of what it sounds like. A responsive search ad can automatically change. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a dynamic platform. It can change headlines and descriptions based on search intent and different actions. And it can uh, uh, update it based on the performance of your ads. So it will actually make some of those changes for you. So it saves you a little bit of time and make sure that it's adjusting those headlines and those keywords to perform the best based on the searches, right? But other than that, it's a basic text ad. It's what you see all the time when you search anything on Google and the, the top three ads or four ads show up at the top. Next are dynamic search ads uh, or DSAs. Dynamic search ads, they take the responsive search ads just a little bit further and it will actually pull content from your website and create an ad for you. So you actually don't even have to do anything once you connect your feed to the uh, to, to Google Ads. Now, if your website is new, fresh, doesn't have a lot of content on it, you probably don't wanna use this because Google will, it will start to pull things from your website that might be a little bit incomplete. So if you don't have a well-built out content uh, uh, marketing system or blog system or your products aren't fully optimized yet, you probably don't want to use the DSA as much. Or if you're running a super specific campaign or if you have a team of people who are managing your Google ads and looking at every nook and cranny for optimization, you probably don't want to use the DSAs as much. But if you're just starting out, you're running a Shopify store or something like that, um, or you have a, a WordPress site and you're trying to grow your law firm, you maybe want to use DSAs because it's going to save you a lot of time and it will use Google's expertise to try to make a good ad versus yours. And if you're a solopreneur, you probably don't have Google ads expertise. So DSAs are generally good for newbies and people who want Google ads uh, to sort of run in the background and, and drive traffic to your website. Next, we have image ads. Now, image ads, we have to be careful here. They can be very effective, especially for retargeting um, and, and brand building. 
but they typically don't result in a lot of conversions, not quite like search ads do. Now, image ads, they usually show up on websites that you're searching for or reading a news article or searching for something else. They'll show up, you know, on the side. Now, the problem with image ads is a lot of times people have ad blockers on, so they won't even see the image ads. Also, image ads are something that we're desensitized to uh, as consumers because we've seen them for so many years follow us around the internet. If you are a large business, large budget, and uh, you have sort of a segment or, or a percentage of your Google Ads budget focused on retargeting and brand building, image ads can be good. But if you're looking to maximize your Google ad return on investment and return on ad spend, image ads probably aren't going to be something that you, ha you carve out a large budget or a large section of your budget for. Uh, just because they don't drive as much immediate revenue. But if your long-term goal is to build a brand, then Google image ads can be valuable. Okay, next we have app promotion ads. Now, these ones are very specific. This is promoting your app, uh, particularly inside Google Play, which is Google's app network. And when I say app, I mean literally like a mobile app. Now, if you have a game, uh, uh, app ads are great, app promotion ads. Are, are great if you have a game, if you have a, a, a mobile app that's like a note-taking app or something like that, any sort of app, then the promotion, the app promotion ads are going to be your go-to because it will literally drive downloads in the Google Play Store. Now, the ads themselves can show up in a lot of different places. They can show up in YouTube. They can show up inside Gmail, um, uh, free Gmail accounts. They can show up on the search network, you know, right in Google Search. So they can show up in a lot of different places, but their goal, instead of getting you to buy something on a website or go and download something on a website or fill out a contact form, it's specifically to download the app. Next, we have video ads. Now, video ads are amazing, but there's a caveat. Video ads are interruption ads. Now, that's different from an, a, a traditional Google ad, which is a, we'll call it a catch ad. A catch ad is something that catches somebody who's already searching for something. So with a traditional Google ad, you're going to search like, oh, I want a pair of white sneakers for the summer. And you're going to search that, and then the results in Google's ad section is going to be white sneakers, right? It's going to show you what you're searching for. But when you run a, a video ad, that's going to show up on YouTube in most cases, in some cases maybe a display network, but that video is going to be interrupting somebody from either watching a YouTube video or getting content that they want. So you need to make absolute sure that your video, number one, you understand who it's going to show to, and number two, you know what their hopes, dreams, and fears are, exactly who they are and what they like and don't like, because that video ad has to engage them from nothing. They don't want to see the video because it's an ad. It's stopping them from seeing what they do want to see. So if that's the case, you need to make sure that you are winning them over very quickly. But if you can figure out that super sauce, that secret sauce, uh, then video ads can be highly engaging and great. They can also be good top of funnel because if you, uh, if you get somebody to watch 15 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever of your video ad, they ca that can be measured and they can be retargeted or fed additional ads later on down the road because you know that they're a little bit engaged in your brand based on the time that they watch the video. And you can exclude the people that clicked skip as soon as it was available on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? So you can be really efficient with your ad spend. Next are product shopping ads. Now, these are the Google ads that you get uh, in my previous example of white sneakers when you search for a specific product in Google. Now you might search, you could search for anything, white sneakers, a Yeti mug, uh, iPhone, okay? Any products uh, can be listed in a shopping ad. And a lot of times the shopping ads are pulled directly from product feeds on your Shopify site or your big commerce site or whatever commerce site you're using. So you can, as long as your product listings are fully optimized, running the shopping ads is relatively easy because it just pulls information from your website. So. Moral of the story is if you are running an e-commerce site, it is very important to fully optimize your website, your customer journey, your product listings, not only for things like SEO, but also for things like shopping ads. Next, we have showcase shopping ads. Now, showcase shopping ads are basically the same thing as regular shopping ads, but instead of showing one product, they'll show a showcase of products. It can show up on a variety of different Google network platforms, but it will show a category. 
right? So if I were to look for something like summer outfits, a Google showcase ad can show a bundle of products from a particular company that, uh, that satisfied that search. So it's a shopping ad. It just shows you a category of products rather than one product. Okay, and finally, we have call-only ads. It's just what it sounds like. It's a call-only ad. So typically, these are reserved for people who are searching for a local company um, or customer service or something like that, right? They have a call intent. That is their search intent, is to call a particular company. They have a question that they can't get online or they just want to skip it. Or maybe they're in the car and they want to call a company to find directions or hours of operation, right? So a call ad shows up and it's a one-click uh, ad that allows you to click and it will pull up on your cell phone your call app and it will immediately call them. So these are highly valuable for local businesses, geo-targeted businesses, uh, restaurants, uh, cleaning services, law firms, you know, things like that. So let's talk about why Google ads work so well. Why have they been such an effective advertising tool for 20 years? And the answer is simple. I did mention it earlier for all of these, those of you paying attention, but <clears throat> it's quite simply, it's because it is a catch ad. Unlike almost all the other, other types of advertising that is out there, billboards, TV commercials, radio ads, podcast ads, Pro programmatic ad buying, Facebook ads, TikTok ads, Snapchat ads. I could keep going. They're all interruption ads. So as an advertiser, you have to do so much work and strategizing and customer journey mapping to make sure that you stand the best chance of not annoying somebody who's going to see your ad because you know that you're interrupting them from getting the content that they are trying to get to. The only one that's different are search ads. And that's because somebody is already searching for something, right? They are, they're going to be fed an ad that is a solution to the thing that they're searching. If you're searching for the best software, you get a Google ad for that. If you're searching for, uh, uh, you know, the, how to get out of a speeding ticket, right? You might be looking for the information. And if the law firm is smart, they know where, where you are in your customer journey when you're searching for that. But how do I get out of a speeding ticket? The Google ad that should show up there are top five ways to get out of a speeding ticket. And it will lead to an article on a law firm site that will tell you the top five ways to get out of a speeding ticket. And way number one is to hire a lawyer. And then they have a button there that says to contact us. You see what I'm saying? So you're, the, the Google ads, Google ads in the search network uh, or search platform are giving you what you're searching for. That is why they are so successful and will be for many years to come. Now, Google ads are fantastic for facilitating the conversion journey in online marketing. The conversion journey is quite simply when somebody becomes aware of something, uh, they see something that they want, they think of something, they're at the top of the funnel. They're at the beginning of their journey. Now their journey starts when they take that first step into trying to figure out uh, a little bit more about the idea, the need, the, you know, the trigger that started their journey. A Google ad can help facilitate people down the journey from top all the way to bottom of funnel, which is the point when they are going to take an action, either make a purchase or sign up as a lead or, or whatever it might be, right? And before you think about how a Google ad will actually do this, you need to make sure you understand the different stages of that journey. And it all starts at the beginning, which is the awareness stage. The awareness stage is just what it sounds like. It's when somebody becomes aware of your brand, your product, your solution, whatever it might be. And a Google ad can facilitate this because they might be searching, the, the consumer might be searching in Google for best white sneakers for the summer. So a media company could run a Google ad that has a list of all the best white sneakers for the summer. And in that, you know, when you click on that ad, which I'd click on because I just, I don't know, like I don't know any of the brands, I don't know any of the styles, I'm just looking for information. I'm at the top of the funnel, I'm in the awareness stage. I would click on that ad and in, in that blog post or that article, they would have a list of those best white sneakers for uh, summer, right? So I'm just getting awareness. The next stage is called the consideration stage. So after I've searched for best white sneakers, I've looked at a few of them, I see Nikes and 
Adi Das. I just I just heard a podcast and they said that the real way to pronounce Adidas is Adi Das. So for 38 years, I've been saying it wrong. And I think we all have, because I've never heard that until just the other day. But Adidas. Anyways, I've already done my research and I, uh, I, I've, I'm sorry, I've already gotten awareness of the best sneakers based on this blog post, right? So maybe I clicked on them. Maybe I made the purchase quickly because I really wanted them and maybe I didn't. But after I became aware of the best ones, now I'm in the consideration stage. So now I'm considering between Nike and Adidas and I'm reading this blog post and trying to figure out, you know, is this something, do I, do I really want white sneakers? Is this something I'm ready to buy right now? Like, where am I at, right? So that's the consideration stage. You became aware of something, and now I'm sort of considering in my brain. Now, this can take a while, or it can be a split second, especially if you have multiple Google ads that may satisfy your search need. So awareness happens when I become aware of some of the options. And I still might be in Google looking at three different ads, and I'm considering which one I want to click on. So the customer journey happens, it can happen in three, four, five different channels, and those channels can be happening at different paces. It's a, it's a highly complex you know, sort of system, and our brain isn't black and white. It's not like cookie cutter, like, oh, I do, I'm aware of this thing, and now I'm going to consider it. It doesn't really work that way. So when I'm in the consideration phase, I am trying to consider all of my options. I'm still kind of far away from that final bottom of funnel decision and I'm just considering what I'm going to do next is now I make it to the third stage which is the decision making stage and the decision making stage is when I'm getting close to actually making that decision based on the awareness and the consideration that I've done so I'm somewhere around the negotiation part in fact some of the customer journeys have a phase called the negotiation phase which is where you're sort of negotiating with yourself right but You've already considered and you're starting to weigh the options and you're coming close to a decision. And now you're weighing the final, most important aspects to come to a conclusion. This might be reviews, it might be price, it might be color, it might be availability, it might be shipping time. There's a lot of things that, uh, that happen in the consideration phase and uh, down towards the decision-making phase that will lead a person, a consumer, to making that final decision. And that final decision is the final phase. And this is the action phase. This is where you act on the consideration and the decisions that you've made. Now, oftentimes, if you're, if, if somebody's shopping, this ends in an actual purchase. That's the action. In some cases, it's signing up to become a lead if it's not a product, right? So if you're uh, looking for a lawyer, you're looking for an accountant, you're looking for a cleaning service, you know, some sort of B2B, it might be contacting right? So that might be the action, especially when it comes to a Google ad. But when you're shopping, when we're talking e-commerce, this is going to end in an actual purchase. That is the final stage. That is the action. And that is what all of us who are running e-commerce businesses are after is that purchase. Okay. So now that you know the customer journey and how Google ads can sort of, uh, you know, look at these different aspects or these different phases of the journey, you can optimize your Google ads based on where somebody is in the journey. So I'm going to use an example uh, from Blue Apron. Blue Apron is a meal delivery service. Um, we found some really cool ads uh, by them, and it shows sort of the facilitation of a customer journey. Now, somebody might be searching for meal delivery. They might be sick of cooking their own meals. They move to a new city, and they just want their meals delivered to make it easy, right? So they might go into Google, and they search meal delivery in my area. Now, up pops a series of ads, and... Um, Blue Apron actually did this, but they did a really good job at looking at their competitors and what ads they were putting out there. You know, one of them said best meal delivery. The other one said top rated meal delivery. And so what Blue Apron decided to do is they said, you know what, here's the other ads that are showing up. We want our headline to make sure, we want to make sure our headline is more attractive than, than, than the other ones. But how do we compete with somebody who's best, the best meal delivery and somebody who's top rated? Well, we could say, Ours is better. And so that's exactly what they did. Blue Apron is better. So when somebody's seeing three different ads next to each other, they're seeing that Blue Apron is better. And they said, here's a $60 off coupon. And they put that right in the title of the ad. So somebody who's in the awareness phase, they're searching for meal delivery, they're going to see these ads come up. And now when they enter the consideration phase, they're looking at these different offerings before they even click on the ad. And they are considering which one looks most attractive to help them make the decision. 
And even though I said that a lot of e-commerce customer journeys end in a purchase action, a little mini customer journey is happening when somebody's looking at these three ads. And the awareness piece is meal delivery kits available. There's three of them based on these ads. The consideration phase is which one of these looks like it's most attractive. It's probably going to be the Blue Apron because Blue Apron is better and here's $60 off. The other ones aren't offering any sort of discount. And so the decision now is, do I want the $60 off? And the action might be clicking on the ad, which leads to a landing page, right? So a little mini customer journey happened just to get them to click on the ad. Now a longer, larger customer journey is going to happen uh, in a variety of different ways. And that leads us to one of the most important parts of running a Google Ads campaign. Landing pages, yes. One of the most important parts of a customer journey, a Google Ads customer journey is the landing page. So great headlines, great descriptions, uh, site links, those are all very important in Google Ads because if they don't click on your ad, they're never gonna buy anything from you, at least not there, not, not through Google, they're not. Not through a Google uh, ad, they're not. But if you do a really good job with your ads, and they decide to click on you, what's the very next thing they're gonna see? It's the page that you link to that ad. And if you haven't perfectly matched up that page with an offering and a call to action uh, that, that aligns with the Google ad, you risk losing that person. You risk having them get there and be like, oh, this isn't what I thought. I'm gonna click back and go to the next one. Or I'm gonna keep searching and I'm gonna go over to Facebook or Instagram and start my search over there, right? You don't want to lose them. You've just spent money on them. They already clicked, you already spent the money. So the worst thing you can do is not fully optimize the journey by building a specific landing page for that ad campaign or ad set or ad group, right? Uh, obviously, depending on the resources you have, if it's just you running Google ads in your entire business, you're gonna to wanna to look for some ad, uh, I'm sorry, some landing page software. Um, there's a bunch of companies out there that do it. Unbounce is a great company that does landing pages better than almost any other software company or page builder that I've seen. Um, but a lot of companies, HubSpot and Optin Monster and MailChimp, they all have landing page builders that you can use. And it just depends on how big your team is and how much resources you have as to how detailed you get into landing page development. But if you can A-B test landing pages, just like you A-B test Google ads to see what works, you're able to build a full customer journey map uh, and system that results in a conversion. Now I'll give you an example. A lot of companies, uh, ones that we've seen, they've hired us, um, you know, we've looked at what they've been doing histor historically, and maybe their Google ads are performing okay in terms of clicks and click through and, and things like that. But they oftentimes just say, we're gonna run Google ads, we're gonna test these Google ads and see which one gets enough clicks. But the page on the other side of that is just a product page that they have, or worse, their homepage. And then they rely on the customer to do the rest of the work, which is not how we, we operate these days. So what you need to do is make sure that you map out a full customer journey, I keep saying customer journey, all the journeys based on all the ads that you're running. Who's this ad targeting? What copy is it gonna show them? after they make the click, what's the landing page gonna show them? And then have a different journey for this one over here, and then have a different journey for this one over here. And the, each of the journeys lead to a unique landing page. Um, now, like I said, there's really no excuse to not building landing pages at scale anymore because you can do it through a lot of different software where maybe it has the same structure, but you change the headlines on each landing pages, you change the images, you change where the buttons are, you change the button colors, you change the questions that are asked of them, you change everything. Okay, you change what reviews show up or what testimonials show up to see which ones convert the most uh, from a social proof standpoint. So it's really important that you map each of your Google ads all the way to a specific landing page that offers that user, that customer, potential customer, exactly what, what you promised them in the original Google ad. And not only that, you should expand that even further and test multiple Google ads Again, there's software programs out there that can A-B test and automatically sort of rotate ad designs, uh, uh, landing page designs to measure which one works best. And then you can fix the static, uh, you can fix the one that is the best performer as the one that uh, uh, people land on when clicking on the Google ad. 
That's all A-B testing is, whether it's ads or landing pages. You test a bunch of variations and you start to get rid of the ones that don't work as well and you start to focus and go all in on the ones that do work really well until you only have one ad for a particular demographic and one landing page that's connected to that ad and you scale up until you've sucked all the resources out of it you can and, and, and pivot from there. All right, so let's look at how to optimize your Google ads. Now that you understand that we're gonna be A-B testing ads and we're gonna be A-B testing landing pages and finding the good uh, pair that performs the best. Now, first you wanna set a reasonable budget. If you're a small business, set a budget that you can digest. Um, generally, if you're trying to spend a few hundred dollars on ads, you're not gonna get great results. Most industries are competitive enough now with Google ads that you're gonna have to spend more than that, but you should set up something that is digestible. A few thousand dollars a month is doable, um, especially if you're focusing just in a geographical area. But whatever you set, set the budget, stick to it, and then A-B test as much as you can underneath it, and just make sure you know that you can't target too many keywords, too many demographics, too many different types of ads with a small budget. You just can't. Next, uh, this one seems obvious, but make sure your keywords are relevant. Um, you, wanna, you wanna understand that uh, it's not just about picking a keyword, right? Like I'm in Syracuse. If I'm advertising for a local CPA, I'm not going to pick the keyword like Syracuse CPA, probably, uh, unless, I, unless I'm working with a huge budget. It's because that keyword is already taken and being bid for by a lot of different companies. So instead, I'm going to think long tail searches. What are people actually searching for? Because chances are they're not gonna be searching for Syracuse CPA anymore. It's gonna be something like, what's the best CPA in Syracuse? What's the best e-commerce CPA in Syracuse? What's the best manufacturing CPA in Syracuse? You know, what CPAs in Syracuse have the most experience in the manufacturing industry? These are the kinds of searches that people are doing in, the, in today's day and age for two reasons. Number one is because we've gotten so used to entering queries into our phones or into our voice assistants like Alexa and Siri, right? So you hit the microphone, you talk to text into your Google as you're driving, and that's how you're doing searches, right? So you need to understand that the way we're searching is very different, and it's long tail, it's long search queries. And so by adding keywords or key phrases in that, that are aligned with those longer search queries, you're likely to keep your cost per click down a little bit more, and also get searchers with the search intent to take action on the ad. In addition to using relevant keywords, it's important to use negative keywords. Now, negative keywords just do the opposite of what a keyword does. Instead of targeting the keyword, you're making sure that the ad doesn't show up for a particular keyword. Now, the best example that I like to use is like high-end items, right? If you're selling a high-end item, let's just say like women's fashion, if you're selling a like a $1,000 raincoat, you're probably gonna wanna use negative keywords like cheap or used or secondhand or low cost because luxury items aren't those things. So you don't want to waste your ad dollars to show up for somebody searching cheap women's raincoat, right? So you use negative keywords to make sure that the words low cost, cheap, used, things like that um, are entered in and prevent your ad from showing for people searching those queries. Negative keywords are a great way to save on your ad budget. Next, make sure you are using conversion tracking. Um, Google has it right built into Google Ads. Um, there's other software programs that you might be using for ad management that has it as well, but conversion tracking uh, essentially just tracks the conversion journey that's taken when somebody clicks on your ad. Uh, it's free inside Google. Uh, just make sure you go in and set it up because that will give you a much longer tail of data that you can use to make educated decisions on everything from your Google ad to your landing page and everything in between. Okay, that's it. That's my overview for Google ads in 2022. Now, obviously there's super advanced techniques and tactics that we use uh, at Good Monster that I didn't cover in this uh, video, but this is more of a general overview for those of you that are starting to think about using Google ads for your business. They are highly valuable. And if you get somebody who knows what they're doing, the return on investment that you can get from these are is incredible and everything is measured. So what do you do from here? Well, I wanna leave you with three of my top tips for running Google ads. Number one, test your Google ads all the time and then test them again. 
Testing is the way that you can constantly whittle away the stuff that's not working and go all in on the stuff that is so that you can ensure that you get that return on ad spend. Number two, I said it already, but I cannot say it enough, is build dedicated landing pages for each and every ad set that you have or ad group that you have. Definitely every campaign that you have. Because by changing little things like maybe you have a qualifier like Syracuse or Buffalo or Rochester or you know different areas, right? If you're, if you're changing your ad, change the landing page just to make sure that it seamlessly integrates with what you're trying to get somebody to do. And number three, uh, I'm not going to go into detail right here, but this is a bit of a teaser, but uh, something that's highly valuable is use your social data to run Google ads, right? So if you're running social ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, TikTok ads, or whatever it might be, right? You're without a doubt collecting data, whether it's watch time on the videos that you're running or click through rate or whatever it might be, right? And if you're driving people to become customers in those ads or generate leads, you're collecting data, right? You have data over there, right? You have demographics, you have um, gender, you have interests, you have all of this information in your social media platforms. You can use that and manually enter that information to target on Google Ads to make sure that your ads are showing up to an audience that you know, or at least a cohort of an audience, meaning like a group um, that you already know is engaged. Sort of like a lookalike audience, but not really. So that's my tip number three. Use these tips and this information to crush your own PPC in 2022. I hope this helps. If you have any questions, as always, you can shoot me a, a DM on any of the platforms. Uh, me or my team will get back to you. But I hope this helps, and we'll see you in the next video.